Present. Nina Arani. Present. Sunny Rosenberg. Russell Danowski, present. Jane Tobin, present. Brian Downham, present. Lisa Wayne, he's absent. Sherry O'Neill, oh, I'm sorry, I apologize, John Steele, present. And uh, Officer Ryan Clark, he is absent. And I'm uh, Michael Andrew, focused on present. Thank you. Um, general public comment. Members of the public may address the commission with comments on items within the commission's jurisdiction other than items on the agenda at the beginning or end of the meeting, but not both. Is there any general public comment? Yes. Please come up to the podium. Hi, Nikki May. Um, I just, the issue of drawings and kittens is not on the agenda this month, but I just wanted to mention it. I just think, I know it'll be back on next month, but I really think we need to keep on thinking about how best to treat our feral moms and kittens, especially because kitten season is definitely approaching. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to approval of draft minutes from the November 2019 meeting. Um, did anyone have comments or corrections for the meeting minutes? Okay, motion to approve. Motion to approve. Motion. I move to approve the minutes. Second. Second. Thank you. The minutes are approved. Moving on to chairpersons and commissioners' reports. Commissioners' reports regarding recent activities in the community involving animal issues that have been discussed by the commission in the past. Do any commissioners have updates for us? Well, I just want to say um, I. Probably everyone saw this, but it was exciting news that the new um, budget that was proposed by the governor includes um, a hefty sum for shelters to move towards um, no kill or no kill. Um, this hopefully this will be on the um, agenda to speak about in the future, but I just wanted to put it out there to say that was pretty exciting news for the shelter community. Thank you. Um, is there any public comment? Yes. Okay, seeing none, moving on to old business. Euthanasia protocol at SF Animal Care and Control. The commission will discuss ACC protocols for when euthanasia is advised and an ordinance codifying the protocol. <coughs> Commissioner Chinovsky, would you please read this issue? Sure, thanks. Um, I guess kind of where we left this off last or two months ago was working to update the city code. Um, and unfortunately my printer's not working so I can print it out, but I did send over um, a version, hopefully to all of you, um, with just some, kind of what we've talked about, just some minor updated changes. Um, those are the things in capitals, so it's, it's all just to, just the section part three um, of the city code that, that we have, the sample city code that we have. Um, and really, and we can go through it and I can read it if you want, but really it's just the, the issues that we talked about, just um, making sure that all aspects of all, everyone, um, all interested parties are contacted within 48 hours, um, all the interested our, uh, uh, parties, potential adopters, adoption partners, rescuers, and all social media sites are um, used within 48 hours of potential euthanasia um, and that's and then just notifying all uh, by telephone all people who are, are interested parties within 48 hours of euthanasia um, those are just kind of the most basic changes that we want and realizing seeing this now that I did not do the most basic thing of um, saying what interested parties are, defining my terms. So that we need to just change, and, and that's pretty simple. But other than that, I think it's like I said, it's just a very basic addition to what a possible city code would be, and that's just making sure that we use all potential social media sites, contact all potential adoption partners, rescuers, um, and the interested parties, I think that's the really the meat of what we kind of wanted to put in there um, and make sure that this is done within 48 hours of euthanasia. Okay, I think, 
Um, so I, I think commissioners have questions, but one, I guess, open question that we had from previous meetings was that no one from EPP had a chance to weigh in. So um, I don't know, Deputy Director Steele, if you had a chance to review this yet. I know that you just joined us today, so maybe not. No, I was asked a couple of days ago if I could uh, now come on the commission, so I'm happy to come back with an update for you. That's perfectly fine and understandable. Just to very quickly, I guess, catch you up on the concept of what we're working towards is um, people have come with us, someone that has been in contact with you, PJ McCossie has come to us, um, and put forth saying, hey, the, the ACC is taking away its call, call interested parties protocol. Um, and it's an adoption or rescue pact, I guess. Um, we just kind of want to make sure that we can codify that, put that back in so that it's in there and that all potential avenues of resources are available. Um, one of the other things can we, we discussed is making sure that we can use social media sites the way other rescue organizations across the country do. They just blast out. These are the animals that within 48 hours are on our um, euthanasia list. Uh, and that is just forward all around the country. Kind of the, the example that I've used in the past is on Twitter, it's so random, I follow Keith Oberman, who's a sportscaster, and he constantly is tweeting out animals from the New York shelter that are about to be euthanized. Um, I'm clear across the country, and I'm getting these messages. So it's, it's just a huge broadband that we can just broadcast this message, and that's kind of what is behind it. Um, other cities have codified this language as well. I believe Austin, Dayton, Ohio, I believe are the two kind of most recent cities. And not that other cities have to do it for us to do it. We're often the leader in, in these, little, these kind of things around the country. More than often, um, our leaders in these kind of um, progressive attitudes and policies around the country. Um, so just the concept of codifying this will just allow that we may agree with this now, and everyone's on board with it now, but just ensuring that future organizations, future people at ACC, future other um, adoption partners and PACs have the same opportunity. Understood, thank you. And Commissioner Kanowski, I actually had a question. Um, I think at the last meeting we also talked about including language about disclosure of behavioral issues. Sure, I believe that's essentially in here. Okay. Um, it's that was already kind of in here. It's the license that talks about license veterinarian, and um, I think that's in the first part of this. Sorry. But we can, if if it's not in here, we can definitely certainly add that kind of caveat in there. That's just kind of a, a base just adoption pack caveat that you're not going to adopt a dangerous animal to someone um, unless there are, it's a very specific organization that deals with those types of animals. And I know there are a few out there that kind of specialize <coughs> that and work towards those, but like I said, that's kind of from my understanding, that's kind of traditionally in the adoption pack and um, partner pack. Okay. So we can certainly put that in mind. I'm um, more than happy to have that language in there, some sort of language like that. Okay, well, we can consider that. Um, do any other commissioners have questions for today about this? <coughs> yeah. Okay, so I guess given that. Um, Deputy Director Steele is going to review this and kind of come back with comments next month, then maybe we should continue this discussion and the decision to February. Right. Okay, great. Um, is there any public comment on this issue? Hi, Nikki May, San Francisco. Um, I was hoping to speak directly to Dr. O'Neill, she's here, but she isn't. So I just, this is a general comment on the resolution, the changes to the code, which I very much approve of, and I hope that that will pass because it may save animals' lives. But the other thing that I specifically wanted to ask of ACC is that they reinstitute, reinstate, the CIP hold, which is the call interested party hold, 
which is what we had for many years at ACC, that allowed me to take an animal in and say, I'm going to put a hold on this animal, and if that animal is not adoptable, for whatever reason, they would call me, and I would come down and get the animal. Um, that no longer applies. There are two holds which don't really apply, the Good Samaritan hold, and there's another hold which basically says, let me know what happens to the animal. That, that doesn't save an animal's life. So my point is, last month we rescued a cat. I rescued a cat from Chinatown who went to ACC. He was very sick. The vets at ACC took excellent care of him. He was suffering from anemia, skin problems. Um, they took excellent care of him, and eventually they decided, behaviorally no problem, but medically, because of the issues, and because they also said that they thought he had neurological issues, he was not adoptable. They reached out to rescue groups, none of whom accepted him. I mean, how many rescue groups are going to accept an animal with neurological problems. Luckily, I couldn't put a CIP on him. So as an individual, I really don't know whether I would have been able to step in and somehow rescue him. Luckily, I was in touch with the inmate shelter. The inmate shelter said, as long as you, Nadine, take financial responsibility and the physical responsibility, we will get him out. You take him out and take him to your own bed. Okay. Um, this cat, who was named Yummy, after the restaurant, he was found behind in Chinatown and is now Bobby, much more appropriate. Shows he's the sweetest cat I ever met. I do have him at home, and I believe somebody's going to foster him to adopt him. No neurological symptoms whatsoever anymore. None whatsoever. It's amazing. Okay. And he's very adoptable. And my point is, would I have been able to save him without a CIP if GMS hadn't stepped in? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. If, if, for future comments, I want to just limit it to two minutes, and I'll be starting that. Oh, uh, yes. Thank you. Two and a half. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm Maria Conlon, uh, representative of adoption rescue partner from with Animal Care Control, can Michelle the Cat Rescue. I um, want to just say again, we've said this several times, but we are in support of this legislation. I've printed three copies for you guys to review of at-risk cats and dogs from uh, New York City's list. This cat has a behavior problem. It has full medical assessment. It has full behavior background. It has the surrender history. They disclose everything on their site. Um, this cat actually comes with a $500 stipend for any rescue who's willing to take it because it has medical issues that's so not available. This cat um, with the behavior issues is only available to what they call New Hope Partners, which would be a rescue group. This part cat with medical is available to the public if somebody wants to take that on, but to a rescue group, it's $500. And then this dog, who had a bite history, was fully disclosed. Unfortunately, this dog was destroyed in the shelter because no rescue stepped up for him. But you know, still, the opportunity was there because it was people now see the faces of these animals and they want to try to help them. So that's where the difference is that makes the the faces are invisible of the cats and dogs and animal care and control that people don't know about. So there's full disclosure, there's medical assessment, everything's there. Their history, their behavior assessments, whether they're right or wrong, they're there. So um, I mean, one thing I will say as a rescue partner of animal care and control. I do not always get a medical assessment when I'm offered a cat with behavior issues. So I sometimes have to ask for it after because the cat has to be sedated. Sometimes behavior issues, as we know, can be because of a medical condition that they have. Maybe they have a wound that we're not aware about. So I think like this is like a great way to be able to save lives. Transparency saves lives. And recently, I'm sure we've all heard about Gavin Newsom funding money for No Kill California. I mean, isn't that don't we want to get on the right side of history and save as many lives as possible? You know, even if ACC is at a 90% save rate, can't we go higher like Austin does, like 97, 98? I mean, I think we can do better. And I also support, like Nathan said, the CMP reinstatement, because why shouldn't a member of the public be able to put an animal, a hold on an animal and take them out if they, if the shelter can't make them available? Thank you. All my things in. <laughs> Moving on to enforcement of California's animal cruelty law. 
Commission will discuss a resolution supporting the enforcement of California Penal Code Section 597 as it pertains to farmed animals. Um, we were presented with the proposed resolution last November in support of activists, uh, many of whom are here, taking action to support Section 597. And since then, the Berkeley City Council <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> passed a similar version in December. And we've been given a revised version that, for the most part, matches that, but with some exceptions that I think we'll get into today. Um, there's also been a brief update on the pending criminal cases. Um, eight activists have accepted plea deals, um, reducing the number of misdemeanor activists from 15 to 17. And the prosecution has indicated some willingness to exercise leniency. Um, Mr. John Fonmeyer is here again from Direct Action Everywhere to discuss and um, answer Commissioner's questions regarding the resolution. So, Mr. Fonmeyer, please step to the podium. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Thank you. Good evening. Um, so, before I open up for any questions, are there any more updates on your end other than the ones I just briefly mentioned? I think that, that covers it. Um, today, I, I was offered a, a plea deal and I declined it. So I will open it up for commissioner's questions. Um, please go ahead. Okay, well I do. <laughs> um, so most of these questions again are um, relating to the language that was changed from the original to the revision. Um, so I think I did print out copies of the um, resolution for everybody and I gave you a copy John too. So, um, I wanted to start, I guess, with the meat of it, which is the first paragraph of the resolution. Mm -hmm. And I think that this was the main change that was made, at least in my eyes, maybe. Um, it says, I'll just read it, um, now therefore be it resolved by the San Francisco Board of Supervisors that the mayor and board of supervisors hereby declare that the 13 individuals being prosecuted in Sonoma County, and this is a change, were acting under California Penal Code Section 597E, to provide domestic animals with sufficient food and water, and the rest is the same. And the original language stated um, that the 13 individuals being prosecuted are nonviolent activists who are investigating mm -hmm. and attempting to expose. And so mm -hmm. um, I watched the video of the Berkeley City Council meeting, but I didn't see discussion of this change. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if you could shed some light on why that change was made. Sure. So uh, that, that change was actually proposed by uh, Berkeley City Council member uh, Sylvia Khan, and we we didn't actually we, we didn't actually discuss that change with her, but she felt like that resolution needed to reflect uh, the the specific statute. I think from the defendant's standpoint, we will we are okay with either phrasing of that if you feel it's important to revert that change to. Okay, um, I think it might be, so I guess the issue here is with the change, um, you know, we don't have complete information about what happened to make the decision as far as whether there's a defense under 597B, and, mm -hmm. you know, we can't run a full trial here, obviously, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um, reverting that language to something like it was previously, um, I think it would be doable because we probably have enough information to support that. So mm -hmm. um, anything that we recommend here, we need to be able to substantiate mm -hmm. to the supervisors and we need to be able to back it up. And so we need to do our due diligence there. So um, mm -hmm. if you're okay with reverting to something like the previous language, then I think that mm -hmm. probably resolves that. Mm -hmm. um, Great. Um, the, some of the other questions I had were relating to, um, in the whereas clauses, um, I noticed that Berkeley City Council um, changed routinely to sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was looking at the citations there, and I also had a question with the language stating that um, commercial animal operations leads to increasing numbers. And so the citations there were, Similar, so mm -hmm. I can um, ask them, you know, ask the questions at the same time. But mm -hmm. um, I have printed out um, 
portions of the cited materials for the commissioners in the packets too, if you want to reference it. But um, so basically, um, so the materials in support of the word increasing, um, there is a 2014 study, pig industry study, um, and the link linked to an abstract of the study, so we don't have the full text of the study, but basically it states that piglet mortality has been exacerbated by farm conditions. Well, I think that's pretty clear there, but there was no specific site, so I just want to be clear as to like what you're referring to. Mm -hmm. said, is, that, is that the statement? For, for the proposition mm -hmm. that the increasing in, in size has led to change conditions? I, you know, I'm not sure that that is specifically addressed in that study, but certainly through an observation of how the, the industry has changed radically in, say, the last 50 years, I, I think that that's, that's a supportable um, proposition. Just when you look at the, the size of facilities and the massive amounts of concentration that didn't really exist um, until you know, after World War II and the increase in funding of animals. You know, and that's, that, you know, you can tell that that has had a, a dramatic effect on the, on the, on the condition of the individual. Okay, um, and then it also cites to articles that have mortality statistics. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to be clear, um, there's an article about mortality in, um, about early mortality in turkeys, and it's stating that the acceptable daily mortality is 1.5% for hens, 2.5% for toms, and then it doesn't say anything about increase or decrease. So I'm just trying to piece together you know, mm -hmm. what's trying to be said here. And then there's a report from the Sustainable Egg Supply um, Coalition that says mortality under farm conditions ranges from 4 to 6, 4.6% to 11.8%. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, are you trying to say that the 1.5 to 2.5% is kind of a natural mortality rate or a mortality rate under humane conditions and the increased mortality rate is under commercial farming? Mm -hmm. Kind of what's trying to be said there? Maybe you can shed some light on it. It's really, it's more just context for, you know, what, what's, what's happening in, in modern commercial farming. I think there, you know, we're not offering an opinion that, that the 1.5% is, is humane. I think our, our position is that under the language of, of California law, it says, you know, and animal. It doesn't actually give some kind of safe harbor for any particular percentage. And, but I think that, it, that most reasonable people would, would agree that what's happening in commercial facilities is, is far beyond what, what most people would think of as, as humane. Um, any of the co-defendants want to add to that as well? No. Okay. Um, so then, the last layout on page one, um, this is the routine, routinely language, which mm -hmm. directly to the council changed the word routinely to sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, I think you felt pretty strongly that you wanted it to remain routinely, and mm -hmm. so I'm wondering, can you speak to that? Mm -hmm. Sure. I, I think what, what we have, you know, certainly we have these the, the studies from the industry itself about you know significant degrees of, of mortality, but from our own observations, when we have gone into these facilities, we see you know a meaningful percentage of animals who are who are on the, the verge of death. And one of the citations that we included was the Animal Services Report, which only was actually created because of the action that we did, that these aren't, you know, there aren't reports that veterinarians are regularly doing for these facilities, because for the most part, they're, they're left to operate on their own. But that indicated that all of the birds that we had attempted to remove were in fact on the verge of death and, and recommended criminal charges um, that, that were subsequently ignored. And so we feel like it's, like it, the proposition that animals are routinely dying is, 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 is very much true. And then changing that to sometimes makes the resolution less accurate. Um, I guess my last big question is, um, 
So I, there were a couple of legal opinions that you provided. Mm -hmm. um, so I read the legal opinion of Black and Clapper, mm -hmm. uh, and she states, there has never been an instance of violence, they do not engage in physical confrontation with anyone at the farm, and they make efforts to avoid disruptions to the facilities. And so I'm wondering, you know, can you speak to whether there's ever been physical force used in any of the open rescues? Then there has never been any physical force. Um, when we, we did one action at McCoy's Poultry Services, and uh, of the 58 activists, one of the activists was arrested on suspicion of assault, but that charge was later dropped. And there's a brief video clip that one can see, and it's clear that this individual was, was not actually assaulting any farm employee and was simply just putting his arms up. And if anything, it was the farm employee who was trying to shove him out of, out of the way as he was trying to enter into a shed. But short answer to the question is no, there's never been any instance of physical violence. And before every action, um, we, we repeatedly elevate our norm of nonviolence in the interactions in our tone and in our word. Um, and I ask because I did watch, and I hope the commissioners have had a chance to look at some of the links and the video footage um, or just look at reports. Um, I watched, we all know about the vice piece. I also watched um, DXD's response piece and I also watched the intercept piece. Mm -hmm. And I watched a lot of videos on um, that DXD has published to YouTube. Thank um, you so much. So there was just one, you know, I saw a couple of incidents that I wanted to ask about. Mm -hmm. um, they're not this incident that are being discussed here, but there was a slaughterhouse lockdown video, mm -hmm. and I thought I did see a couple of instances of physical confrontation. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know what I'm referring to, but again, I'm just trying to be as accurate as possible here. So mm -hmm. as we're debating this, I'm wondering, you know, like what support do we have to say that this is always civil disobedience sure. versus something else? Sure. So, um, and was that video from an action in the United States, or was it international? I assumed it was the United States, but I'm not sure, actually. Okay. So, the, the only uh, slaughterhouse lockdown that's happened in the United States was at the Reichardt action, which was, I think that was June of, of 2019. I'm not sure I, I know what particular instance you're referring to, though. Um, so there was a an instance of one of the activists trying to enter one of the barns where one of the workers had was standing in the doorway mm -hmm. and she used her body to kind of make an impact with his body, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, and then the other incident is, you know, the activists were shackling themselves to the conveyor mm -hmm. uh, belt system and there was, I guess, a malfunction and mm -hmm. one of the activists almost was injured. In Correct. That. So I was wondering if you could speak to those two, if you remember. Sure. Regarding the first instance, I don't have I don't have a recollection of, of that ever occurring. As far as I know, it's never been discussed. Um, I you know I, I'm happy to try and figure out exactly who who that activist was. I'm not sure if any of the other defendants might be able to speak on that question. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, in the other instance, the, the gentleman who, who um, was injured is actually here as well. Um, so, does it Let's go, Tom Chang. Yeah, I can yeah. talk a little bit about the Thomas incident, unless sure. you want to come in. Known as the Thomas incident, which is the um, where Thomas had uh, locked himself to the slaughter line and um, an employee um, to turn the slaughter line on. So, yeah, he was injured, um, but, you know, that wasn't like something that we did intentionally, of course, as activists. And so I think when we do these actions, if we're willing to put ourselves in physical harm, obviously hoping that that doesn't happen, but our intention is never to cause any of that harm ourselves. I do believe I know which incident you're referring to um, at the red card action, where like someone was trying to like, slip in through someone's arms. And obviously, when we're there, we're like, trying to rescue these animals and like, doing what we can to, to get them out of those facilities, but it's never our intention to like body check someone or something like that, but I, I think I know what you're talking about and I can see how it would look that way. I wasn't there person, you know, in person, but um, that's definitely never our intention to 
even like make physical contact with someone, but sometimes when you're in the middle of trying to like rescue someone and someone steps in your way or trying to get, get to a place, like um, the instinct is there to try to keep going, but um, I'm real tall. Okay. <laughs> and, and then also say on, on the incident involving Tom, there was a, a safety backup for that. Another block was placed on the line itself to prevent that from happening, and, and that block failed. So there was a there was a backup. Unfortunately, it didn't work, and we're we're very lucky that that Tom was not more more injured. But um, but certainly, you know, as Amira said, it's it's never our intention for anyone to, to get hurt, and especially. Um, if you as a result of any physical alter alteration that we might start. Okay, you know, and there have been actions we've done where our activists have, have been assaulted by people, but we, we elevate not responding in kind at all and, and remaining nonviolent. Okay, thank does that you. answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Um, that's, that's all the questions I have for now. I wonder if other commissioners have questions based on what we just talked about. Maybe you can help me, um, Nina, understand. If, if we were to send this resolution to the Board of Supervisors, why would we <coughs> encourage our Board of Supervisors to discourage the Sonoma County District Attorney um, to, to prosecute these charges? This seems like, I don't think this is what we do. Is to, with all due respect, I don't think it's within the realm of our Commission to suggest to our Board of Supervisors that they engage in regulating what other <coughs> counties do. I understand is this, this is language that was put into the Berkeley, um, mm -hmm. right. Um, I respect that, but I don't, I don't think that that's our place, and I wonder well, what, what's the thinking there. Right, so, um, John, maybe you can also fill in on this, mm -hmm. but if there are portions of this that you know are questionable or not within our authority, obviously we can remove those portions. Um, I think the thought is that this is a symbolic resolution, yeah. um, but I do understand as well, especially when we're making kind of a legal determination, there is, um, it is a legal interpretation. Mm -hmm. And so this is not just symbolic. It has mm -hmm. more effect than that, so maybe you can speak to that. Yeah, and, and um, yeah, I, I certainly appreciate the concern as well. I, I know that this implicates a separation of powers concern. This is a different branch of government, and it's also in a different jurisdiction. I think that it's this is an appropriate forum for, for voicing this opinion for a few reasons. One is that the the products that, you know, the products that are created in Sonoma County are sold throughout the Bay Area, and including in, in especially in the San Diego, San Francisco. And so I think it's in the interest for people in San Francisco to understand what's actually going on inside of the facilities where, where these animals are raised. And then the second argument is that this fundamentally is a political prosecution. And I mentioned before that I turned down my plea deal. I, I should mention what that plea deal was. It was uh, three misdemeanors deferred entry of judgment, meaning the, they don't actually get entered, they get held in advance, and if I satisfy the terms of probation, they get dismissed, and the probation terms were just 80 hours of community service, no further crime, and a stay away order from the commercial facilities, whereas I'm being charged with the felonies carrying a decade of prison. So we're going from a decade of prison to not even ending up with a criminal record, and that's unheard. That kind of ratio from charges to the initial plea deal offer is, is unheard of in criminal law. And the idea was, we, we think that this was an attempt to dissuade people from trying to take action. And Sonoma County is a, it's a, it's a rural county where the, the commercial agriculture operations are immensely powerful, and they wield a very strong control over the, the, the government there. And I think it's therefore appropriate for other governments to, to opine on what's going on and encourage district attorneys everywhere to uphold the law that our that, that voters of this state have have, um, have voted for. Does that answer the question? I can appreciate that. I, I still disagree, and, and I don't disagree with your reasoning. But I believe if we, um, you know, to the extent that we have any power and influence, 
I think if we stick to the issue of um, the animal rights and, and perhaps not advocate for the advocates, if you will, mm -hmm. um, I think we might, um, our resolution might fall on more welcoming ears. In other words, um, that part of it to me does, as you indicated, it does sound political. Mm -hmm. um, and I think by bringing that into it, it perhaps might um, turn off some of the um, audience from the message of the animal rights. But that's my opinion, and I wonder what other commissioners, how they feel about that. Um, I actually kind of disagree. So I think the whole point of this is that we are supporting the activists who are working on behalf of the animals. That's kind of my understanding of this and why I support this is that we need to support the people who are out there doing this work. If they're not out there doing this work, no one is going to be out there doing this work. These animals aren't going to be saved. No one's going to know about this. The conditions are going to just continue on these things. Um, one little thing I will disagree with you, sorry, sure. the animals aren't products. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I know you mean that. Um, but to that point, the kind of concept is that type of animal agriculture doesn't exist within San Francisco. It only exists in these rural, or some of it probably. There are definitely slaughterhouses in San Francisco, but there that type of agriculture doesn't exist in San Francisco. So people from San Francisco need to go to where it exists. They're San Francisco citizens, and as a San Francisco citizen, I want to support them and say I don't agree with this and I don't want this going on here. And I want my board of supervisors to support those actions as well. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily out of our realm to say we support this action and we support the board of supervisors taking a further action. Um, we've often asked them to take action on things outside of San Francisco um, on more of a statewide level. Thank you, Christian. Um, so on that sense, very quickly, um, two other kind of little points. Um, I'm not sure I'm here where you were referring to the routinely. Um, I didn't see it in here, but I think that actually should be kept in, you know, because these things are routinely happening. <laughs> Absolutely routinely happening. It's common knowledge to people who know about it. it and the reason you're doing this is because they're routinely happening. Um, and the reason you have to do this is because it's routinely happening, unfortunately. Um, the other little thing that I did see, the increasing part, um, I think that is in there because this is increasing the way that annual agriculture is increasing and the way that it's sped up and the way that these massive farms are created is to increase the numbers. Um, so if you put in the beginning sentence of there, just add another increasing to where it says, whereas the, now it says the massive scale, if you just put the increasing massive scale of industrialization and model commercial animal agriculture leads to increasing numbers, I think that solves that problem. Yeah, I do understand so, what you're saying, yeah, Dr. Commissioner, and thank you for that. So I, I think, I yeah. think the increasing is in there. I think that needs to be in there because it is increasing, and okay. it's going yeah. to increase the way it exists. And just by adding, so, furthering that in a sense. I kind of wanted to soften the language, so I kind of come between the two of you on this, and that's the the civil right of nonviolent protest as outlined in that 597 being able to go in and check. So if I were to amend the language, I would it would be more to encourage the county um, district attorney to dismiss the causes on the basis that this is a basic civil right towards nonviolent protest and that it happens to be in support of animal rights which is outlined in 597 there. You are doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing, going in there to support this penal code, which is violating the rights of those animals, and you're doing it in a nonviolent way. Mm -hmm. So having this, the Board of Supervisors support the language of the basic civil right to deal with an animal right mm -hmm. is how I think you could amend it, mm -hmm. getting into the specifics of take that money from that to move to that seems to me to be to make it more contentious a little too in the weeds um, maybe perhaps and I, I, I think the language of just allowing you the fundamental right to exercise as a person in the society to support this violation of code. 
Well, could we, is, so when we talk, okay, if, if, therefore it be resolved, to give rise to 13 individuals being prosecuted, is there something we can add to, um, to bring it to, I mean, are, are among the 13, how many are San Francisco citizens? I mean, I, I think what's missing is, but you explained it, Russell, very well, Commissioner Wisnowski, um, but the link between what happens in Sonoma and, you know, these people in Sonoma and what is happening here, and, and there's, there's a gap there in this language, I feel. Mm -hmm. So if we could maybe talk about how many of these individuals are San Francisco citizens, or I don't know, something along those lines. Or a direct link to how many eggs we get in San Francisco. Or direct, exactly. <laughs> For example, yes, yeah, something. They're, they're, I need to see something that, um, for me to be comfortable with it, that, that really links San Francisco citizens to this event mm -hmm. beyond just the participants, mm -hmm. with all due respect. Sure. Yeah, yeah. No, that's well taken. Uh, uh, four, so none of the current <coughs> defendants are San Francisco residents. However, four San Francisco residents have been arrested in okay. connection with these actions. I think that's worth mentioning. And, and yes, in fact, I think it's worth mentioning that this is where we achieve in San Francisco comes from these facilities. Yeah. And I don't I don't see that specific I mean obvi maybe obvious, but I think it's worth pointing out um, in this to make it more relevant to our board of supervisors. I would agree on on tying that relevance in a little bit better, but I just wanted to come back briefly to specifically what charges um, now, if, if, assuming you continue to decline any type of plea bargain, what are they opting to, to go through with uh, prosecuting you on? I'm, I'm currently facing eight charges, and the, the felonies are burglary, uh, conspiracy, and, and, and grant that. And um, since our last meeting, I had reached out just to get some information from USDA. This um, they haven't gotten back to me. I was wondering if you guys have explored or heard back anything in terms of going back to the routine nature of these types of things. As far as I know, with swine and, and other commercial animals, they do have acceptable mortality, acceptable. Um, you know, even down to how often the machine may mess up when animals are stunned and um, processed at, at time of euthanasia. Mm -hmm. Any information from USDA APHIS as far as where they stand on how these operations were, were operating in regard to their regulations? I, I do not have an update. Any other questions before we go to public comment? Yeah, actually, I have a question, please. Um, what What is, you, you mentioned about the plea um, mm -hmm. bargain and that you refused it. Um, what, what are the next, um, what does the calendar look like as far as any upcoming dates or anything else? Like, do, I'm just asking just for like time you go, so, and what is, what's on the calendar, what's on the calendar? Sure, uh, so two of the defendants, my, myself and uh, Rachel Ziegler, who's also here, have a preliminary hearing on February 20th, that's probably going to get moved. And then the other four defendants have a preliminary hearing on March 10th. Or, uh, sorry, my, March 19th. Right. Thank you. Okay, is there any public comment on this issue? If you wish to comment, please come up. I just want to remind everybody, I have two minutes for Anyone who wants to make a public comment? Hello, my name is Heather Hyde. I am an animal activist and I travel for a cause. Uh, I currently live in Los Angeles, I'm in here, so I see a lot of different uh, animal agriculture and farms as I travel. So many feel that animal activists are the extremists, <coughs> but isn't it the ones that harm, hurt, abuse, and kill these defenseless animals the extremists? but also those that turn a blind eye to the crimes on life that are the enablers. How is it that the ones that choose to save the animals from the hands of the murderers, the ones that are looked at as criminals? 
Animal rights and animal welfare has been around before the human rights of child advocacy. And child abuse laws have been around uh, since after animal rights was formed. If you are not aware, the first abuse and child welfare case was modeled after an original animal abuse crime. If you don't know the story of Mary Ellen Wilson from 1874, please look her up. She was a little girl that was abused from her mother. And when she was uh, called to witness, she said, Mama has been in the habit of whipping and beating me uh, almost every day of my life. She used, to whip with a, she used to whip me with a twisted whip rawhide, the little girl, little girl would tell the court. Mr. Henry Berg, who was already known for initiating the work of the Animal Society of Prevention of Cruelty to Animals that was started in 1866, aided and founded a New York Society the Prevention of Cruelty to Children was founded in 1875 after that. Because of this little girl being whipped, the organization is deemed the first world to act in a child protection agency. My point is, how can we continue to turn a blind eye to the neglect of these poor animals? They are horribly raised in squalor, deprived of the basic right of living of beings. Being whipped, being hit, being punched, being burnt, lack of proper water, food, they will never know love. They will never know the basic rights of having a family. Their families are being Thank ripped you. apart. Thank you. Thank you. If there's any public comment, if you can please line up on the side just to facilitate the discussion. Is there any more public comment? Hello, my name is Jordan Davis. I'm a DXC uh, member, member, pronoun she, her, and I live in San Francisco. And I just want to voice uh, my support of the uh, Right to Rescue resolution. And uh, yes, there are multiple jurisdictions involved here, but there are DXC members in the Bay Area, and many of them put their uh, lives and uh, freedom on the line to help animals, and I also wanted to mention like the uh, animal, uh, the uh, corpses and secretions of uh, these animals, which we call like military race, <clears throat> whatever. Of course they end up in San Francisco, and they also end up in uh, food banks, and as a uh, low-income resident, it's really horrendous that these uh, slaughterhouses not only race, animals and squalor, but they uh, basically reduce the commodities and uh, then dump them on low-income people, thus uh, compromising our earth, the health, and most importantly, the animals. Uh, they uh, arm the and kill these animals, so just pass this out. Let's uh, hopefully, uh, the Board of Supervisors will pick this up, and uh, we need to get this on. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Rocky, and I am born and raised in San Francisco. And although I'm not one of the felony defendants, I'm one of the people who were arrested at the right car action in Sonoma County. Therefore, this resolution and issue is near and dear to me. As a person who was born and raised here, I am proud to be part of a city where its constituents care about the animals. Like, uh, cats being one of them. Uh, and not only are they, do they care for them, but they help and you know, advocate for them. And what my friends behind me are doing for other animals like chickens and ducks in Sonoma County are absolutely no different than what other actors and you know, probably even us, uh, what they do is no different than what we would do for the dogs and cats here, which is to save their lives. For and for that, they are being prosecuted by the district attorney just because the animal agricultural industry have a heavily, heavy influence over the local government there to do their bidding and by extension skirting transparency to the public. Right now, you have the power to stand up to animal cruelty and corporate corruption. If you vote in support of this resolution, just like how this Berkeley City Council did, uh, vote in favor of so of this resolution, you are sending a strong signal to the Board of Supervisors that we the people do not condone prosecution of whistleblowers and not issue you. So I hope you all vote in favor of this resolution from, from one fellow San Franciscan to another. 
and thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Priya Sahani and I'm one of the felony defendants in the case. Um, and uh, I also am an immigrant who was born in Punjab, India. And one of the reasons that my parents and my family immigrated here is because we truly saw the United States, especially the city of San Francisco, as the land of the free. And um, again, San Francisco uh, is known as a city which makes progress on social justice. And as someone who worked at the Tenderloin Housing Clinic, um, for the low-income community, I can I can definitely say that this city truly does uh, live up to its reputation, and this is just yet another opportunity for us to show not only Sonoma County but the rest of the world that we are um, you know we're taking all lives, including non-human lives, seriously. And um, I was just in Sonoma County a few weeks ago talking to my attorney. And um, I asked him, what do you think of the right to rescue resolution that passed in Berkeley? And do you think it's helpful? And he said, absolutely, that it sends a strong signal to, uh, you know, to the prosecutors, to, to everyone in Sonoma County. And not only is that helpful for me as a felony defendant, but most importantly, it's helpful for what we're fighting for. Um, and those are the animals uh, who I have seen die uh, in front of my eyes and um, you know, and what we're facing charges for the animal cruelty that we've exposed. So thank you all so much, and I just wanted to thank you know, all of you for considering it and for doing what we all know is the right thing to do. The world is headed uh, you know, on this path, and we're just following it. And a special shout out to um, for, for saying that animals are not products. <laughs> thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is Setu and I live in the San Francisco area. Like most people, I grew up consuming a variety of animals, thinking that uh, it was all good. Uh, most people don't think about it. And only uh, the truth, really, of all this abuse is really kept hidden uh, with a lot of corporate power. Uh, the truth is hidden from us. And only because of these brave activists who risk their own personal freedom, uh, willing to go to jail, uh, giving up easy plea bargain for the risk of 10 years, uh, only because of those heroes do we know what's going on. And I know if I was in those cages, I wish someone would come and document what was happening to me. So uh, the world looks to San Francisco. This is the, probably the greatest city in the world. Like taking leadership on things like supporting uh, gay rights, supporting uh, the fur ban. So many other amazing causes have happened. The world changed because of things you do and we do in San Francisco. So please support this resolution and protect these heroes and continue the tradition of exposing the truth. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there, uh, my name is Lori Green. I'm a 15-year San Francisco resident, so I thought it was important for me to come here and speak. Um, I've been arrested doing activism with these people. I'm not at the Red Card Talk Farm. Um, I didn't have anything prepared to say. I just kind of wanted to speak from the heart. And, um, like, ask you guys if you guys have pets at home. Um, a friend of mine is taking care of my dog right now so that I could be here. And, it, you know, just think about what you would do when you've seen animals suffering and, like, what kind of response you would have if you would want to um, help that animal. I know since, you know, I was a kid, like, if I saw animals um, lost or on the ground, like, it was just a natural instinct that I think we all shared to want to protect them. I, I didn't really have to be taught that. Um, so when we do these investigations on farms, you know, these big industries rely on secrecy and they're largely self-regulating. Um, someone mentioned they have an acceptable amount of death and suffering, which amounts to you know, hundreds of thousands of animals. Um, and to see my friends who are treated like criminals in Sonoma, you know, handcuffed, we couldn't, couldn't wave or say hi to them, it's just ridiculous that people with big hearts for animals who would do what all of you would do if you saw an animal suffering, are being prosecuted for that. So um, I'd like to know that as a San Francisco resident, that when I stand up for animals in the future, that I won't be prosecuted as well. So thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Commissioners. I'm Patricia Briggs. Um, I just wanted to say that I think, you know, it's kind of upsetting to hear that, you know, if you don't come from San Francisco, it's like you should have a voice here. Um, as someone said, we do buy a lot of products that come from, you know, Petaluma, Santa Rosa, whatever, from Sonoma County. So, um, I have to say also, Karen Davis with United Poultry Concerns, she has been in the movement for, you know, probably 40 years. She once wrote a really incredible article in her magazine called Poultry Press, 
It said, never be an apologist. You know, don't call animals. You know, it, even animal people call animals it, which drives me insane. You know, a rock is an it. You know, don't put, call them he or she. If you don't know what they are, say he or she or whatever. Um, I have to say, when I worked on the live animal market issue in Chinatown, you know, 25 years ago, the commission was not worried at all about activism. On the night when they took a vote, we had people literally outside Terrible Police Station. The whole SWAT team was there. I mean, it was. Funny, it was not funny, but it was funny. Literally, we were standing next to the SWAT team members in full, you know, battle gear, like as if we were going to be, like as if these folks have felt, you know, we were the criminals. And and the the merchants, um, they, I had a sign showing all the horrible things in the live animal markets. They came up to me when the press was trying to interview me, and they were screaming in this high pitched tone. They turned down the microphone when we went to talk. They did all kinds of nasty things. So um, I think we should send this letter, not worry about the content. Just send it, and it can hurt. And then, um, so one, one last thing is, um, yeah, just, just keep focusing on our goal, and then stop worrying about, just think of the, the prize at the end. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, my name is Matthew Nemsky. I'm a resident of San Francisco for about 10 years now. I've been involved in activism in Sonoma County for two or three years, uh, including having been arrested and uh, threatened with arrest on multiple, uh, multiple actions, including ones we were discussing earlier. Um, I just wanted to implore that I think supporting this bill would be, or this resolution would be really helpful. Uh, we've tried an increasing number of tactics for getting to City of the County of Sonoma to pay attention to these issues, and it does fall on deaf ears. We keep getting redirected to different uh, that different agencies about who's responsible for enforcing laws, and uh, nobody wants to actually take responsibility. And so that's why we're resorting to coming to Berkeley and San Francisco and other cities here to try to get support to put on the system to get the laws that are in place just simply enforced. I would really appreciate this one. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Thomas Chang, and I was born in San Francisco. I lived here for a long while. And um, I was the person that was almost killed in that action uh, at that farm. And I can't speak on the resolution of what laws that are on the books, but I know why I'm doing activism and why I put my life on the line for those steps that day. Um, it's because it was the right thing to do. Um, people don't know that's what's going on in these factory farms, or farms in general, or even where their food comes from. Uh, we just want to give light to that. And we go to these extreme lengths, we put our lives on the line because we're not going to see any other way. Right? So, um, as San Franciscans and as a leader in this community and also in the world, uh, on ethics and morals, it's just the right thing to do. And that's all we're here for. We're here to kind of bring light and not death to the world. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Nicole Garcia Marcastro. I live in Oakland, California. I was born and raised in Oakland. Um, I've had sort of a lonely decade. I had to go vegan uh, uh, and, uh, for health reasons uh, about 10 years ago, and I haven't been able to find anyone to spend time with. Uh, I had uh, some problems in high school and stuff, but when I joined this group, like uh, it's uh, it becomes like helpful uh, to my family because my dad had a health problem, like which he uh, has been struggling with. And he's lost 50 pounds since uh, the end of uh, the uh, Animal Liberation Conference uh, last August. I, they've been helping to give me motivation to cook for my family and uh, gave us a chance uh, to get better from our problems. And so that's been really helpful. Also, I have one other thing I want to say. Um, my I, um, experience at the right part was uplifting to me because I had shame issues before then and um, 
uh, one thing that I learned there is that uh, by being courageous in a group, I can feel protected because that's a choice of an agreement that I made with my friends there. That I could feel protected, although I was in danger, and also I could feel like I was part of something that was important. And there's people in the organization who are specialists in animal care, um, they, uh, who are specialists um, in, in animal rescue, which is um, it, it's really important for Americans to uh, recognize as a, a professional um, title. And there's um, atmosphere of caring uh, between people and professionality, which it lends us an opportunity to uh, make an impression on the industry so that the industry can change, because we want people to get a chance to uh, get <coughs> new professions, not have to work in slaughter anymore, uh, have a purpose to live. And um, the the police were called many times on right card. This is sort of a third point. Okay, okay. Uh, it's almost along the same lines as the second. But uh, the police were called yeah. many times yeah. to ask to help with Rikar, which where there was ducks there who were walking around with no water on the floor. They have wet feet. They're supposed to have water. Then we had operators who went in to investigate and got information about it, which should be. Okay, but basically, um, as a result of us going there, although the actions was harsh after some frustrations had occurred, the, um, the result was that the police did come, and so like we could, it, with the help of the right to rescue, we could have a, um, uh, we could have an opportunity to tell law enforcement in a way with a more official, professional stance, which this organization des deserves. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, my name is Antonio Moore. I live in San Mateo, but I lived in San Francisco for many years, and I was a veterinary technician for many years. And I just wanted to say that I'm actually very um, proud of San Francisco's history of standing up uh, in defense of animals, not suffering needlessly. I was remembering that in around 2006, I came down to City Hall um, because I heard that uh, there was a proposal to outlaw declawing cats in the city, and I came and I spoke, and that resolution was passed, and declawing became illegal in San Francisco, and also San Francisco banned fur recently. So there's a great history of standing up um, against animal suffering, and I think that um, we all know in our hearts that a chicken or a duck or a cow or a pig is as worthy as our, our protection as our pets. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't happen that way in our world, but I think that we know in our hearts that they are just as worthy. So I ask you to consider that. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Michelle Dari. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. As an Indian American, I have to share with you, growing up, one of the first things we learned embedded in our Indian culture is daya, which means compassion which is why San Francisco is my most favorite city in the world. I think we do a great job showing compassion to humans, and I think we can start doing this to um, non-humans and animals to show this kind of compassion and care. And these activists back here are so brave. I did not realize that I was a part of the community by consuming animal products growing up. And if it weren't for these activists, I wouldn't have woken up. And I'm able to wake up more Indian Americans because of the work they do. And I think it's time. It's time for San Francisco to pass this resolution so other cities can catch on. Hopefully other states will catch on. This is the place where compassionate movements start. And I ask you to support this resolution for that. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Susan Wheeler, and I just wanted to uh, remind the commission that we, uh, that a previous commission um, saw some, uh, some absolutely horrendous video of that was taken of a of a dark farm where they were doing horse feeding to make foie gras, and the commission not only looked at that but they voted to ban foie gras or or to recommend to the supervisors that foie gras be 
the band in San Francisco, and it was for a while. Um, I think, unfortunately, um, uh, things got changed. But um, so, again, uh, you guys have been great activists for many years. Thank you. Is there any more public comment? Okay, so seeing none, um, it seems like based on this discussion, um, we might want to consider some revisions to this. Um, so I guess we could go one of two ways, and I want to ask what the commissioners are comfortable with. If we want to try and have a discussion here and make the revisions and hold a vote, or do we feel like we need more time to review everything and um, think about any potential revisions? I guess the big caveat would be a time issue, but it doesn't seem like there's a time issue per se for you, correct? Before our, our next meeting is in the third week of February. Okay. Well, that, I, that would be my concern. Sorry. The only um, modifications that I'm looking for is I would like to add in that the reason this is relevant to San Francisco is because much or all of our um, animal products come from surrounding counties. I think that should be stated, even though it's obvious. Um, and then secondly, I, I still not sure, I just don't like to encourage our supervisors to get involved with a outside county district attorney. Um, and I'm wondering if what the commissioners feel about um, the, so now, therefore, it be resolved that first paragraph, and then what if what if what if the second paragraph were removed or somehow modified? Russell, Commissioner Tanowski, do you have any? Is it all or nothing? Other commissioners? I'd actually like to leave that in because I think that's kind of the point of why they're here in the first place. Is this is a pending action for them right now? That's probably why I asked about the time issue as well. Is that why we want to recommend this is because they have file dates coming yeah. up. And it's kind of my assumption, I guess I probably shouldn't assume that, but we want to we want to support them in their trial. And that's I think why they're here. But I, I like I said, I, I have no problem stating that in if other people want to discuss it further than that. And I, like I said, the other kind of minor change that we can make is just if you have an issue, we can just be in, add the increasing to that, that paragraph. Mm -hmm. um, there was that change, and then there was the change that um, Commissioner Tobin mentioned as well about potentially adding language about um, civil rights, which well, it is essentially the what you're calling it, the right to rescue. So it, it's a right to support a, a nonviolent action of that particular law. Um, is, is there a way that we can combine that information into the concept of asking the Sonoma County question? Well, I have a simpler proposal, and that is um, we could take a vote now and see if there are enough votes to approve this measure as written or with the modification of, I will, you know, that, that we get, or as written. I mean, we could ask, we could see if we could pass it as written with the majority. That's Just to clarify, the paragraph in question is the, this opinion is provided pursuant paragraph? Ooh, sorry. Um, no, what I was just saying is what is the one, two, three, four? It's the eighth paragraph. From the beginning, or the, whereas the massive scale and industrialization of modern commercial animal agriculture, the second paragraph up from the first day in the first day. Um, if we just say, whereas the increasing massive scale of industrial and industrialization of modern commercial animal ag operations leads to increasing numbers, so just add an increasing of the thing. Right, so we can add that change. Um, that was that was just one of Nina's concerns. I think it was her concern. Is like where is the kind of potential proof that it's increasing? Um, and my other concern was the language that you know was in the original draft, um, the first paragraph for the resolution, which is it used to state um, 
13 individuals are nonviolent activists who are investigating and attempting to expose abuses. And now it states we're acting under California Penal Code Section 597B to provide domestic animals with sufficient food and water. And the only reason that I'm not certain about that is because we don't have all the facts about what happened to say that that falls under that. And I think, according to Mr. Fromeyer, to revert that change back is okay. So that would be the one change I would revert back. Um, and then we can add the increasingly language. Um, and then um, Commissioner Forte, as far as adding a nexus to San Francisco, do you, do you want to try to add that or just vote as is? It's up to you. Madam Chair, if you want to, if, if if you think that the, if you think that it can, that we have a majority to support it as written, then we could just go make motion to vote now. Well, this, sorry, does anyone else have any changes or suggestions that they want to make that we can figure out? Or I just I, I still keep going back to there's a fundamental right to protest, and that's not. Ex I mean, that's what no, I, under, I understand that, and I think I kind of agree with that because that's kind of the basic point in a sense. So where should but, that go? Um, where, where I think it's in the resolutions, and then now there would be, a, you know, you have in here, um, if the 13 individuals being prosecuted were acting under a penal code section to provide domestic animals, but also a fundamental right to nonviolent protest. In between those two paragraphs, that, after that first paragraph, there needs to be a, a resolve that what you're saying is some sort of it's, civil. It's a basic, fundamental human right for. I, I think under that, under penal code, that's exactly what the penal code. I, I think I agree with you in that sense, and that ties it together with this is the point of what's here. They're acting part of their civil duty under this penal code to rescue these animals. That's right. Okay, so what should we say? So we'll add another paragraph. Um, so, be it further resolved that that is a basic fundamental right to protest. Yeah, I'm sure we can come up with a language on that. I'd be happy to work on that. But it's essentially the outline and whatever the <coughs> right language is to protest in there. But that was. That's the right to do that. They did it nonviolently. They did it in um, reaction to a violation of code, a penal code of a penal code, and they shouldn't be prosecuted for doing that. And then that flows, in, and that do, flows into the next paragraph of why we were asking the board to ask another <laughs> right. county so, to, to does that satisfy you a little bit more? It's better. <laughs> it's getting there. Um, it's just giving more reasoning. Yeah. So, Commissioner Kevin, are you am I willing to add in the language of like, basic that. human rights? Sure. No, the, as as written, or do you want to take time to? I would add a, a I would add just a few changes. Or submit that. And yeah, and then I I don't know that we can actually discuss amongst ourselves, of course. So it would only show up in the February meeting then that this the finished document resolutions. And that we approve it then. Okay, so basically we'll add something to the effect of this language, but everyone's comfortable with voting on that before seeing the final language. I, you said something different than that. But yeah. Say, I think say we wait to vote. That's I think what she only said. about the final product okay. that comes out of it. That I think we all agree that there's a they have fundamental right to rescue and we want to support that. Well, we, I, I think you don't necessarily have to vote on, if we're just going to draft the letter and then draft another copy, then we can vote on it okay. next meeting. I think that's what you were asking. I think right. you know, what you were getting was, did you want to vote on it now and say, hey, we'll write this other paragraph, and then that's essentially going to be the final letter without well, us officially that seeing that one other paragraph? Or do you feel more comfortable voting on it next week after we all see the entire finished kind of product? We've done it both ways. In yeah, the past. We that's why. That's why. We've done it both ways. That's what. That's why that. I think asked. we. Uh, I can, I'm, I'm comfortable myself. either way. Yeah. One, I go back to a timing issue with their. Yeah. I I agree, that, and I want to be sensitive to your yeah. timing as well too. So like to to expedite this, I say we go ahead and. I'm I'm so fine we'll just make with you changes and then I'm fine with the changes that we're proposing and you writing another paragraph of saying what we're of so what we discussed. 
Okay. And just to review those three changes are... Right, well, because if I break this and I miss something... Right, oh, so specifically the three changes are... I mean, this change, my change, and that change. So sure. just to reverbalize. No, that's, no, that's fine. That's fine. I can reverbalize them. Um, the, the changes are um, to add to one of the whereas clauses, whereas the add the word increasingly massive scale and industrialization of modern commercial animal operations leads to increasing numbers of animal suffering from starvation or dehydration. So adding that word. Um, the other change is to revert the first paragraph of the resolution to the original resolution, so it will read, hereby declare that the 13 individuals being prosecuted in Sonoma County are nonviolent activists who are investigating and attempting to expose the abuses of non-human animals in commercial animal operations. And the third change is to add a resolution paragraph between the first and second par resolution paragraphs stating um, something pretty much to this effect, be it resolved, uh, be it further resolved that it is a basic fundamental <coughs> right to protest. Um, and then the last change that we were considering was to add a nexus to San Francisco. So if we can think of something right now, we can include it. Or Commissioner Forte, what do you think? I'm okay with not including something about where eggs come from. <laughs> okay. Okay, so. Um, Oh. Well, if, if it would be helpful, we can also say that four of the arrestees were San Francisco residents. I do think that's kind of important to say that it is a fundamental right for San Francisco residents to be able to protest where their food yeah. stuffs originate. So where would you place that? I would put it in the right place. I'd put it in yeah. the same yeah. right protest. Yeah. protest. And that, that's at the end of the letter, it ties it all back in. And, right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's our guidance. Okay, okay. Sure, that's fine. Great, great. And just to clarify, so the four individuals are not of, just are not among the thirteen individuals individuals being prosecuted. Not that it matters, but we I mean that's correct. It's still important, but we don't we won't it'll be in a separate paragraph and it'll say amongst the protesters or those arrested were um, four San Francisco citizens. Oh well it's yeah. Different from the 13 being prosecuted. That's fine. Okay. I don't, I don't think it really matters. Just say among those arrested were four. Four yeah. arrested. Right. Yeah. Okay. Or even actually, there's not a. I don't see. Is it. It's policy. Do we need numbers? There were residents of San Francisco arrested. Right. Regardless of what they were charged with, it still speaks to their right to be able to be there. I agree. <laughs> Just sorry, just to clarify, there was more than four okay. San Francisco residents who were arrested. Okay. There's yeah. been 148 total, so sometimes it's a okay. little hard to keep track. But so, um, and some of them were charged; they just accepted um, the plea deals. Okay. So the the right to including San Francisco residents, including San Francisco, yeah, who have been arrested. So would that language be something to the effect that we get resolved that it's the basic fundamental right to for San Francisco residents to protest, including issues of where their food is originating, something like that? No. 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 Can you please read it back? Um, well, I, I don't have it yet, but <laughs> I will read it back to you. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'm going to share it with you because you have more details for some of these whereas is that I want to make sure I get right. Um, but the language is, is a fundamental U.S. right mm -hmm. to protest. And so I'm not saying specifically a San Francisco right. right. So and my question is then where is this San Francisco nexus language to be? Oh, that's included that uh, there, it's a basic right to protest and um, the um, right was violated and in, that includes San Francisco residents who were arrested exercising their civil right to protest protest anywhere anywhere right mm -hmm. okay 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 if everyone's clear on that then i think we can go ahead with a vote um all in favor aye aye aye, aye. aye. i'm in favor okay anyone opposed okay then this resolution passes yeah. <laughs>
you the final draft, but we will not discuss the final draft at our ne next meeting. Is that correct? That's, That's correct. correct. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and once the final draft is done, then we need to approach the supervisors with it um, and find a supervisor to sponsor this to take it to the full board. Correct. So okay. our work is not complete, it's just beginning. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all Thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Changes. Updates on recent changes to PGNRA dog walking rules. Commissioner Cohen, would you please take this issue? Yes. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick update that I got from Sally. Um, as you know, we have this letter here that was sent to uh, a number of people, including the uh, regional director of GPNRA and also the uh, board of supervisors, the mayor's office, um, and the, the acting director of GPNRA. So the main change is that the coalition of uh, dog groups from three counties within GPNRA has filed two lawsuits against GPNRA. Um, one goes after the compendium for being an unlawful change to access, and the other is because they didn't respond to the Freedom of Information Act request in the time that they're required to do so. So, so far, um, the update is GGNRA has not signed the compendium, which would make it the law. Um, we're not exactly sure what that means yet. If they withdraw the dog changes, or then uh, made in the compendium, then um, the lawsuit will be dropped. So to some extent, things are a little bit more confused than they were before, but that's where we stand with it right now. So nothing's been done but, except for two lawsuits that have been filed. I'm sorry, can you please close the door to the room? Thank you. And I will continue to keep you posted if there are any changes to it at all, but nothing so far, other than the lawsuits. So do we believe that filing of the lawsuits um, put a pause on the final? Yes. Yeah. I do believe that because yeah. it was supposed to have been signed at the end of November, and it was not. Is there any um, commissioner's questions regarding this issue? Other questions? No, that's good. I thought I saw online that part of Sonoma County was just closed. Or not Sonoma, was San Mateo, sorry. Did you see that? I, I saw on, I saw that on their website on their Facebook post or maybe it was just a saying this is gonna happen. If these changes don't make it, I just put that on. Might be. I was curious because I saw I was like, hmm, that seems interesting. Yeah. Well there was a San Mateo area in the, the map that we there saw, was. right? Okay. Yes, that includes San Mateo. Mm -hmm. So the three that are um, that are in this uh, that filed the lawsuit would be Marin, San Mateo, San and you're, wait, I'm sorry, I think I misunderstood. Those counties have filed lawsuits. Yeah, they're part of the lawsuit. The in, lawsuit. In, 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 it's, a, it's a consortium, so SF Dog yeah. is, okay. So the lawsuit was the three counties that are impacted by it, and that includes Marin, San Francisco, and also San Francisco. And SF Dog is also. Yeah. SF Dog is leading the charge. The SF Dog is a. I realize that it's a little confusing on that, but they are part of the whole lawsuit, right. leading the lawsuit effort. I see. Got for it. those three counties. Great. But every there's a consortium. Got it. Thank really you for clarifying. Is there any public comment on this issue? Okay. Seeing none. Moving on. Uh, commission governance. Commission will discuss efforts to secure oversight from a city agency and also update commission administration. Commissioner Coven, can you please read this? Yes, um, and I'd like to also include Michael in this group, um, Angelo Torres in this as well too, because he was with me in the meeting today that we had with the city administrator's office, Bill Barnes from the city administrator's office. We met with Supervisor Stephanie's office, um, the person we met with there, uh, it is working on this in conjunction with Hillary Ronan's office as well, too. Hillary Ronan and Supervisor Stephanie are three of the two Rules Committee members. 
and they are sensitive to the fact that we are experiencing this and they know we're not alone, but we're one of few that are experiencing this unique situation. And they are committed to resolving it, solving it for us, um, but we don't have an answer just yet. Um, once those two have worked something out, it might pave a path for people like um, from the Veterans uh, Commission that is also experiencing something as well. So that's how um, Supervisor uh, Stephanie's office can the issue of veterans affairs is raised here. Do they have any sort of timing, um, like insight as to when this could move along? Or? No, but they appreciate our persistence, if yeah. that helps at all. And they, I, they know it's frustrating for us, and they're working out a solution. But as far as we heard today, we're leaving it in their hands, and we're going to check back with them. With them. Yeah. And we will check back with them. But I do have to say, um, well, first of all, props to, to you for all your help with all this. Um, I, she included me on some of the email messages back and forth, and it does seem like it's quite a few people kind of being involved, but at the same time not really sure who exactly should be involved and who should take the lead in it. And I'm sure you've experienced the same thing. Um, but I definitely feel there is an interest here. And also, I mean, I was surprised that uh, when we did meet with them, it just seemed, as I said, that there was a genuine interest, and they do want to get this resolved. And they do want to help because they, they want to make sure we have what we have to go forward. And I would also like to convey their appreciation as for as, us yes. as volunteers who are doing this work and realize that this must be frustrating, but they're very committed to solving this issue. So I'm sorry I don't have an answer for you yet. That's great news. That's great news. Yeah. Thank you both. Wow. Um, well, I will, I will add that. Um, as far as I know, neither one of those supervisors, Brendan and Stefani, are not up for re-election in November. There, there are some who are going to be, so that's that's good. They'll be around for a little while at least. Um, and I also wanted to thank Commissioner Torres for taking it upon himself to overhaul our website, um, or at least lead that. Um, so it's long overdue, so thank you for that. Yeah, once I, once I get access to the trouble, please, <laughs> around the corner at some point, I will start to do it. We also discussed as well just um, the different iterations of the, the city websites that we have, just for government ones and otherwise, and how um, you see a lot of the different commissions um, that kind of take the lead off of whatever particular website, I guess, that they're kind of incorporating into their, into their outreach. So ours, as you know, it is pretty old looking. Um, um, Nina and I and myself, we met to go over some of the different things and the different links and the different pages that need to be updated. So we're looking at also, hopefully also maybe looking at a different type of website as well, which hopefully with the upcoming training and with some other things and with the right people, knowing the right people, hopefully we'll be able to resolve and update very soon. Yes, um, and just one more item from me. Um, as we're kind of doing this administrative oversight and website overhaul and general like governance oversight, um, name change potentially and kind of overhauling the commission. Um, I also wanted to suggest one more thing, which is um, taking a look at our own rules, which are in our manual. Um, I've done that. If any commissioners are interested in reviewing our manual and suggesting changes, then maybe we can discuss them next month. Um, I'll probably circulate a draft. Um, most of the changes are just to conform with what we actually practice. So for example, the manual says, um, you know, requires us to raise our hand where we speak, we don't follow that. Or we don't always have elections in July, for example, just to update um, the manual. So, okay, okay great. Um, is, there, so is there any public comment on this issue? Seeing none, we'll move on. General public comment. Members of the public may address the commission with comments on items within the commission's jurisdiction other than items on the agenda at the beginning or end of the meeting, but not both. Is there any more public comment? Please come forward. First of all, I forgot, I want to hand this to um, John Scale after he said the examples of the PRC service. But um, I want to just, uh, my name is Maria Common again, and we brought the Fair Loan issue to the agenda, I believe it was last um, summer. And I just want to kind of reiterate that we don't want it to drop off the radar or drop off the agenda, even though I know the last couple months it's not been on here. 
Um, our concerns are that you know, as having everything over to SPCA allow, loses um, you know, no transparency. There's no IRIC oversight. They're not accountable to San Francisco residents. They're accountable to their donors. Uh, whereas the ACC is just accountable to the residents of San Francisco. Um, they're all, so they should not just be handed over at some point. If, SPCA is handling it, and ACC should be involved, so there is some oversight for us, and for us to have, have some say in that as the members of the CAP community. Also, again, I mean, Kit Susan is a right around the corner. It'll be here before we know it. We're enjoying less kittens right now, which is great, but starting um, in April, the onslaught of kittens will come into the shelter. So again, the sooner we trap, the better, the better chance of survival for all the animals, and cats and the less homeless cats on the streets of San Francisco. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Susan Wheeler again, and I just wanted to um, uh, thank Maria and and say I second what she says. Um, the SBCA interestingly still has the the, the, the um, feral cat program, which I was a proud member of for many years. Um, we had a wonderful system where out in the community, we, in each neighborhood, we had people who trapped, we had people who recovered, but we had people who transported cats to the SPCA for state neuter, and all of that has disappeared. Um, the SPCA has just gone rogue on us, but we're still here trying to keep the, the streets of San Francisco uh, free of more feral cats and doing that by bringing in moms as soon as we can because um, otherwise if they're put back they may, they'll get pregnant right over again and um, if or if they're not if they're not trapped until their their kittens are four or five weeks old, um, uh, and and it's just it's a dire situation. Um, and so many of us have invested so much time and energy and money in this program, and just to see the SPCA turn their back on it is really really upsetting. Thank you. I'm Elda Brandon, an ACC volunteer, and um, I just want to hand over the mission statement to you to look over because leaving feral moms and cats and the nursing kittens out in the field is in conflict with it. San Francisco ACC is a taxpayer funded open admission animal shelter since 1989. It's provided housing, care, and medical treatment to wild, exotic, and domestic stray lost, abandoned, sick, injured, and surrendered animals. SFACC's doors, they say, are open to all animals in need, regardless of species, medical, or behavioral condition. The mission statement clearly indicates ACC is responsible for the homeless, domestic cats that some folks are trying to recategorize as wildlife. Thank you. Please step up. Hi there, my name is Betsy Martinez. I used to work for the San Francisco SPCA. I just want to let you guys know that the San Francisco SPCA does um, do terminating pregnancies on mom cats. I know we don't need any more kittens, but it's something that um, changes the mental, emotional, and psychological trauma of the mother cat. And sometimes that cat becomes unsociable, or it just it creates a lot of trauma, and it becomes harder for those mom cats to be adopted out. So I just wanted to let you guys know that that is something that they do do, and that they do terminate pregnancies, pregnancies very, very late, like late term. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Janice Kendall. I've been a volunteer in the past at SPCA and PCC. And just wanted to comment on the past year what happened with the SPCA um, totally rejecting dealing with homeless mom cats and their kittens and suggesting that the people that call in can figure out how old the kittens are and track them. But what they really need to do, and, and the other thing that they did was 
we have some amazing volunteer trappers here in the city, and they've shunned them. Anybody that spoke up about this change in policy, they've banned from working with them, which is just totally is wrong. And whenever somebody calls in, they send one of these experienced trappers out there to evaluate the situation to see if it's really safe. And that's probably the best time to capture the, the kittens and the queen and bring them into, to, you know, if, if they find homes, um, foster homes to foster the mom cat with the kittens, that's probably the best and least stressful for the mom cat. And then everybody gets socialized and adopted and it's all good. But ACC really has the, the mandate and the responsibility, and SPCA is obviously disowned dealing with feral queens and their kittens. So I hope ACC takes this on, please. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to thank you all for being here today uh, as I believe San Francisco is the sister city of West Hollywood that has helped set the precedence and the bar in regards to making a cruelty free zone. I helped get the mayor elected and city council to do to get all of those things done and I really just appreciate you guys being here to be able to help out people and the animals that actually care because we are their voice the only opportunity we have. I encourage anybody that can on their free time when they have a cause and see it in council meetings to come speak up because if you don't, things just get passed without. So I just want to thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Swania Bakubi. It's nice to see you all again. Um, I've been here many times, as have many of the people here, uh, because this issue is so important. We really do, um, you know, I think we feel really urgently. This is the start of the new year. Kitten season is coming soon. Um, things have not changed um, enough, uh, if really, um, really not much at all. And we really need animal care and control to take responsibility as their mission statement says that they should for any animal that comes that's an open door shelter, really for them to abdicate risk responsibility for these innocent young animals that are vulnerable is just not okay. Um, it, we're coming to a critical period and uh, I really want us to resolve this as quickly as we can. It's, it's really important to start getting this done ASAP before more animals die. We don't want a proliferation of feral cats in San Francisco. We don't want um, and, you know, cat kittens to go so long that they can't be socialized. Once it's past three months, it's really difficult to socialize a kitten. We need those kittens rescued as soon as they can be, as young as possible. And there's so many wonderful volunteers, fosters, rescue people, trappers waiting to help, waiting to partner with animal care and control. And how are we going to make them responsive? It seems mysterious to me, but we just really need to work on this and resolve it as soon as possible. Thanks so much for your help. Thank you. Last comment. I just wanted to thank all of you on the commission for being courageous and taking on difficult issues. This is San Francisco. This is what we need to do. We always have done this. We ban fur. We ban declaw in the past. We've done a lot of wonderful things in San Francisco. We need to continue, and you guys are doing a great job. So we leave. Thank you. Is there any public comment? Okay. Seeing none, Jeff, moving on. I don't see put on the calendar for future commission meetings. Um, we will definitely be putting the euthanasia protocol back on for next month, right? Um, Commissioner Kevin, GGNRA changes, does that? If there's any updates, I will, I will include those. Okay. Um, I'd also like to add in there too, right? if we can, possibly, I'd like to invite UC Davis to talk a little bit more about the um, uh, $50 million grant that they're receiving potentially, if that budget is proposed. Um, I, think, I think it's important that we find out what the use of those dollars or how it will be um, Okay, 
So we can add to state animal shelter grants, or will you let me know if that's happening? Yes. Okay. I would like to add that and see if we can get a response from UC Davis to come and speak a little bit more about what that means. Okay, great. Um, yeah. And then um, the feral cat management policy issue, it seems like this issue is ongoing, um, mm -hmm. and it seems like kitten season is approaching, so do we want to add that for next month? I think so. Okay, so we will add that for next month. Okay. Um, so we are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.